Future. Future Talk. Welcome to Future Talk. I'm Zohara Hieronymus. Have you ever noticed how we're told that economics is far too complicated for the average householder to grapple with? Well, I suggest, if anything, economics is not that complicated. We can make it complicated. But what if we look at it as a system of energies, whether they're free market, socialistic, fascistic, capitalistic, you know, they're variations on a theme, how services and supplies and products are distributed and made and valued. Well, our guest this hour, Christopher Largent, looks at the world, sometimes as I do, probably as many of you do. If everything is an energy, then we can look at the economy as no different than we look at the soul life of an individual or a nation or of the world. Christopher Largent joins us this portion of Future Talk to examine his co-authored work with Denise Breton entitled, The Soul of Economies, Can We Prosper Without Greed? He shows us just how a soul-based economy would look if the values we treasure, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness were integral in the marketplace and how different the world would be that we'd inhabit if, in fact, we looked at the economy as it really is a mirror of our community. Join us next with Christopher Largent on Future Talk with me, Zohara Hieronymus. I'm Zoe Hieronymus. Joining us is Christopher Largent. His book, The Soul of Economies, Spiritual Evolution Goes to the Marketplace. That's what we're going to look at now. Christopher, welcome back to the program. Thank you very much, Zoe. It's nice to be here. You do a wonderful job of looking at the economy in a way perhaps not everybody has thought to do. At what point did you think, hmm, you know, let's look at the role the economy plays in our civilization as though it had a soul? I think when... My co-author, Denise Breton, and I first started thinking about economies and actually political systems at the same time. We realized that there was a kind of mentality that drove both, and that mentality was something that was based on the individual choices that, that people made, and then how the collective began to reflect those individual choices. Now, behind that, which is where it came in because Denise and I were philosophers, still are, <coughs> is the issue that people look at the world in very definite ways. In fact, interestingly enough, in business, it's, it has been defined uh, in very much the same way Denise and I did the definitions in our books, and that is as a very controlling kind of mentality. That is, essentially, if the world is a difficult or demanding or dangerous place, the way to respond is to be very controlling. If that mentality is brought in to decisions that people make, and if that's brought into the marketplace, then the economy looks a certain way. It, it tends to run down fairly quickly because a uh, very controlling attitude gets very hoarding, and hoarding is actually a form of theft uh, based on a sense of lack and low self-worth and so on. So the economy is going to grind down, and you're going to create things like stagflation and so on. And we can talk about that. But an opposite mentality, a mentality that the universe is a place at least potential abundance with interaction of energies and creative abilities and so on, then what will happen is the economy will look quite different because people will be eager to exchange their goods, their services, their products, their ideas, their creativity. Yeah, you know, it's interesting for me when you reduce looking at the economy, and because I'm not trained at all and just sort of enjoy the privilege of being completely ignorant of it academically, <laughs> but very in touch with it practically, <laughs> both as a broadcaster and as a person involved in business and having a business and running a business and that kind of thing, is, is when we do look at it as energies, energetic exchanges, it's interesting to me that as we move away, and I've always said we kind of exhibit this addiction to a death economy, you know, it's, prohibit it's prohibiting, it's restrictive, it verges on fascism in terms of government control, it's not free market, and that things disintegrate, whereas when it's more expansive, more life-centered, more reverent of life and love, how different it would look. So coming back, though, to this first question, your, your book titled, The Soul of Economy, Spiritual Evolution Goes to the Marketplace. Give us an example of the current status that you see and the vision you hold about what's possible. Because people have been getting more and more in touch with who they are inwardly, and that's where usually revolutions and cultures start. They're actually not the stuff of the school books and the historians talking about wars and political shenanigans, but it's usually really 
deep inner change that causes a culture to change. When people get more in touch with that, then they get more focused on what is now being referred to as soul, that deep inner sense of individuality and a deep sense of inner essence. Because that's happening more and more and more, uh, there's more potential movement for the economy to turn into an exchange of energy. Every time that happens, the controlling mentality squeezes. Mm -hmm. It's like the hand trying to hold sand or water. It doesn't work, but it still does it. And it does it to a more and more noticeable extent over time. So that, for example, when you look at the economy the way it's set up, the economy is set up the way the old company stores were set up. That is, the, the cost of goods and services that it's clear you're going to need, everything from your homes to college programs for kids, those costs will go up enormously, many, many more times than income will go up. So that over time, you know that trying to pursue those things, you're going to get into debt. So finally, you're so much in debt that you owe your soul to the company store. And that was the old mentality of company stores, that the workers would be so much in debt they couldn't leave the work. And, and now we have a model of that, not just of the individual person in debt to the credit card company, but we have it whole nations in debt to the World Bank. Exactly. That scale is a staggering scale, but the process is exactly the same, and the result is exactly the same. One entity ends up being an hawk to another entity, and so has to more or less do what, that, what the controlling entity says. Exactly. So whether it's an individual who, through whatever reasons, has to give up dominion over whatever it is they've acquired, nations are now being forced to surrender their right to make and keep their own laws in presumed, you know, generosity of some forgiveness of debt, but right. there's no forgiveness at all. Right. There's a, a war on national sovereignty, right. and in the same way there's a war on um, free individuality when you're dealing with a, a more restricted entity, that is, the person, as opposed to a nation. But you have the same kinds of restrictions in either case, and the difficulty with that is that in practice that never works, because in the end, no matter how much the controlling mentality thinks tries to generate and thinks about more and more and more control. In fact, an economy is about the exchange of goods and services. And to a great extent, economists and economic theories can provide explanation, but also they can make an economy look very complicated. But in the last analysis, it's how are we going to exchange the goods and services? And for instance, an early in the century economist, uh, last century, Thorsten Veblen, used to comment that if you have pure capitalism exchanging goods and services, individuals are so creative that eventually it becomes a pure distribution service. You don't need money. That there's so much. There's so much abundance. There's so so let's, let's talk about, as you have as a philosopher and sort of as a sociologist, in looking at economies reflecting people's values, the current economic method we have of control over this manufacturing, the distribution, even the demand, which sometimes is totally false and you know, just created as artifact, how, how would it change if we were looking at it more as a distribution issue rather than, you know, who's going to control it all? Veblen's point, and I think I would agree, is that if you let a person go and you don't restrict them, that is, if you don't restrict their creativity with, say, the compulsory educational system we have now, that's very negative, because you, as you also know, I'm an educator, very negative on, on maximizing creativity. but if we didn't and, and designed to be so, having looked at the original Prussian plan that it's been modeled after right. and the UN's facilitated in our country and elsewhere, it's very clear they want factory workers that are robotic in their emotions as well as their minds. Right. If that is replaced with uh, real maximizing of the creativity of kids as they're growing up and then as they become adults in the community, and that adult contribution can begin at a much younger age than we think without involving kids in work, that is, kids can be creative at a much younger age with ideas and products and services while they're working in their communities and educating themselves in far more sophisticated ways than we think. If that goes on, everybody produces a surplus. That was Veblen's point, that people uh -huh. are so creative, they actually do more than they themselves can consume. Right, right, right. And the only challenge is the distribution crowd. How can we distribute this to people? How effectively? How quickly? And it becomes a bit of a marketing program. How, how do you go about letting people know that, for instance, in my case, I write more, I write more stuff, I talk more, I consult more, I also have a consulting business, then I really need to, for mm -hmm. a, a couple of extra people, I can actually pass these services around. Mm -hmm. uh, there are products that can pass around. 
there are products that people may have on the side that... So the focus would become, as a society, less on who controls the production of something, the patent, the whatever, as much as how do we distribute it so that it enhances further production. Exactly. So and we look at everything symbiotically related rather than controlling the whole. Right. And one of Veblen's points was that there would be so much, and people would get so much involved in maximizing creativity and therefore maximizing the distribution of it as an adjunct that everybody would get pretty embarrassingly wealthy and comfortable. Mm -hmm. And that the real challenge, instead of being mere survival, which is in a sense a negative challenge, um, they would have the pol positive challenge of being more and more and more creative. Yeah, or as, as I joke once in a while, you know, I'm a cheerleader for Paradise on Earth, but I, I really mean it. I mean, I mm -hmm. think that that's, as Buckminster Fuller said, our only option. You know, utopia seems pretty practical to me. Chris, I want to come back to your first chapter. You talked about, you know, we have ways of making tools. There's a billiard bar, ball way, and there's a hole-seeking method. And you show that these two different ways also reflect in our role as producers and consumers and the values we have. Can you kind of summarize that for us? In a billiard ball model, what we called it is there's a, a sense of separateness that carries with it a fear that there's not going to be enough. And so the immediate economic, economic implication is to operate from anxiety and to try to hoard and control as much as possible. That's going to give an economy that looks very much like ours when it's doing its worst. The opposite and the idea of a whole system is an interconnected universe and an interconnected universe of activity and creativity which then gives a sense of people contributing as much as abundantly as possible and trying to discover where their talents and abilities and their highest levels of creativity lie and bring those to the economy and try to find ways to make those work as, as effectively as possible. So to offer things. And that offering sense carries with it the kind of idea of abundance and exchange that even in a trying time will help people. So, for instance, recently, when I was, I've been shifting my consulting business to try to get different kinds of contracts, especially the short form being that paid better <laughs> when my bills were going up, um, I realized that the more I networked, the more I let people know what I wanted to do, what my ideals were, what my goals were, what my values were, that n interconnected network produced exactly the kinds of responses that I was looking for. Well, and I think the, the point that you make is true no matter what field we are involved in professionally or what household we're part of, is that this inner growth that you talked about at the start of today's program of people, you know, focused on their soul and on their spiritual values, and that sort of part of self that seems to be immortal or at least to be rather present and significant to the lifetime, is that this is an undercurrent in all civilizations as, as to whether or not we're going to evolve or devolve, having put it in that context, what does a single currency like the euro dollar or an effort to homogenize money as a, as a method of exchange, what does that do to the spiritual expression of diversity? It's a, it's a difficult question, I think, because on one hand, any kind of unification of currency is going to look like a move toward efficiency. And in some ways, that's going to be true. The other side of that is going to be that some, some diversity will be lost. I think the issue there is the mentality with which it is employed. Mm -hmm. If something like a euro dollar is, is in the end used for controlling purposes and within a controlling philosophy, it's going to end up being a pain in the neck to somebody or another. And that's, I think, why some countries with a strong sense of individualism have tried to resist it. Yeah, Denmark. Um, yeah, wasn't it? Norway voted out and Sweden yeah. noted it, voted out. But I think the, the, the point about that is that if you are using a philosophy, if any country, any individual is using a philosophy that respects diversity, that respects individuality, that in a sense respects the soul, then the policies are going to tend to move in that direction, even if... Now, I'll tell you what, you hold your thought. We'll come back and complete more of that when we return with Chris Largent on Future Talk. Christopher, coming back to what you were saying about it's the intention that we bring to something. I asked you, you know, this homogenization of currency like in the euro dollar. 
uh, what does it do as an expression of the soul of, of diversity? And you said, well, you know, it depends how we come to it. If it's as a controller, it's going to end up being not what we want. If it's as a diversifier in terms of, you know, allowing something to be facilitated by sharing that common currency, then it will be an unfolding, a flowering. How, though, but I, but I had a final question about it. How, though, does it impact the reality of, for instance, a third world country being in debt, having nothing, and no diversity, and no homogeny either, other than indebtedness, and these other more affluent economies where they're experimenting with who gets to hold the money and at what interest and for how long? Mm -hmm. I think right now that's, that's one of the big problems. That is, when the currencies are unifying like the euro dollar, it really is to the disadvantage of countries that are being controlled by these very large supranational entities that have actually, with programs like GATT and so on, have, have made themselves more and more powerful and, as a result, have the potential to be more and more and more obnoxious. Which well, is obnoxious is a polite word for I was, I totally to polite, enslaving, actually. you know, <laughs> a population, telling them, you know, what laws they can meet right. and who can be a judge. And right. That's one of the big problems now. The, the international, as nearly as I can discern from trying to follow what's happening in these areas, the international use of these kinds of entities, including currencies, is really very controlling and very negative. Mm -hmm. And the in individuals in the more affluent countries have a right and perhaps even uh, a sort of responsibility to ask what those big entities are doing. Because to a great extent, the individuals and the communities in the more affluent countries have, they're in a better position to say, why are we contributing to this? Why are we allowing, for instance, something in this country, why did we allow something like GATT to get passed into law? It was The really general agra agreement on tariffs and trade. Right. Uh -huh. uh, there were parts of that that were very, very, very oppressive. Horrendous. And, and, and to our sovereignty as well. It's as not as though as well. every nation doesn't come uh, without a price to these kinds of, you know, agreements. Right. And I think it, it's a case that one of the things that I have always suggested is that we try to lose the sense of these big faceless organizations and find out as specifically as possible who said what about what. So a lot of times if I'm going to um, a senator's office, for instance, I will get on the phone with a staffer and say, I want to find out what the senator, he or she, is doing about this. What happened? What's the thing? I know the senator doesn't know. Give me the staffer who knows the most about this. Yeah, well, you know, I have a, I have a thought on that, having spent years in geopolitics. What you're saying is true. The staffer's important and having bill numbers in front of you. All right, so back to this notion of calling your congressman and dealing with the legislation that you find ethically offensive as well as in real truth unconstitutional, but how does this all keep coming back to the soul of economies and the spiritual vision you attend to? I think what will happen is that individuals will have a two-fold activity then. They will have an activity such as calling your congressman, son, congresswoman, senator, that has to do with some kind of community work that says I'm doing something that's effective in the community. That reflects my inner values. But that's where the other activity goes on, and frankly, I think the more important activity. I don't think we're very clear on how consciousness works in the world yet, but I think what we will discover in the future is that when individuals start living with a very high integrity according to their highest values, and then they bring that to every activity, including the economic activity, that high-valued integrity will begin to transform the consciousness around that discipline, around that activity, and it'll start to change. So I actually believe that with individuals coming to economic systems and money systems and so on, with, with a much higher sense of intention, your idea of exchange of energies, for instance, and for people to bring their highest sense of integrity and creativity to it, that will start to change the way people actually use money. And you've seen, just as a minor example, that in the robber baron era, there was a kind of hoarding that was hard to imagine. Yet the second and third generations of those families tended to, to create individuals who more and more felt uncomfortable about having so much money and gave it away, so that now a great deal of the hoarding doesn't happen with those groups. It happens more with individuals who can make huge amounts of money suddenly when an industry takes off, it's Bill Gates. We still have the hoarding. The mentality needs to change. But when the mentality gets really obnoxious the way it is now, that we have something, what's the number? We have something like 300 billionaires that control nearly half of 
that's half and nearly half the world's money. When it gets that bad, then it gets into very high profile, and people will, will recoil. They will say, this is really what we don't want. And then people who are doing the hoarding stop being heroes and start being actually part of the problem. And at that moment, yeah. the consciousness has turned a corner. Well, and I think that it, at least at Future Talk on a program like this, because we interview, you know, those that sort of at the edge of the line of their field of expertise, we often hear people describing some component of what you're talking about. And it seems to be this this appreciation of oneness. You know, if I were to call it any one thing, pun not really intended initially, it, it is that, that there is an observation that at the quantum physics level, even when we're talking about the way in which energy works to mobilize something in time and space, to how we go about living our lives in relationship, every time one can point to, or we can point to, that axiom of integration, aggregation, symbiosis, all things being related and then yet individually unique and significant, the closer we get to the solutions to our problems. I think so. I think that's what I started hearing 30 years ago when I was in college. And I remember thinking that I, I wondered how practical this was, that every time I live my life that way or people around me live their lives as if consciousness had this effect, which it un- does, and we're going to talk about that more after this. You spend a good deal of time in your book doing something I found very fascinating, drawing from sources that you say, you know, if we look at the Western world and the Western economy, we have as a historic document that was shared equally the Bible, and in it the days of creation, the Ten Commandments, uh, the Buatides, the Lord's Prayer. I mean, these are fascinating (laughs) sources to have drawn from to show, let's look at this as an economic model. So, So let's do that. Right. One of the things that we had done as philosophers and also teachers of the world's religions was to say, if you take a sacred text and you argue that the philosophical and the spiritual are, are in fact practical, you should be able to draw conclusions from it. And I think that the days of creation at the beginning of the Bible are one of the most famous and one of the easiest cases to see, because when individuals have, even independently of any kind of sacred teaching, come to analyze a, any creative process, how one would start a business or Uh, build a restaurant or um, uh, that kind of thing in the economic area, or even sculpt. uh, Someone did it with writing uh, an article. How you manifest anything, really. How you manifest anything. It turned out to be those seven steps that were nearly identical to the seven days of creation. So let's talk about them. I think it's it's fascinating because it really brings your whole worldview into a practical application. Mm -hmm. All right, so the seven steps. The seven steps, the first is um, conceiving of an idea. Let there be light. It's the way it's worked out in the Bible. You have to sort out all the materials. In the Bible, it's the firmament, which sorts the light above from the light below. By the time you have that, you hit the defining period. Uh, in, the, in the third day of creation, it's how the dry land appears. The thing has to be defined. That's usually in businesses and creativity when people hit the wall and they really have to hang in there. Even the third thousand year period in the Bible is uh, Moses and the crowd wandering in the wilderness, and they all had to hang in there. That happens in businesses in transition as well. By the fourth stage, the system is up and running, symbolized in the fourth day of creation by sun, moon, and stars. And once you have a system in place, and as the brilliant economic theorist uh, W. Edwards Deming proved with working with companies in Japan, if you focus on the whole system and its dynamics, then the whole thing starts to yield. And in the fifth day of creation, we have the teeming fish and the, the birds flying in the sky, this powerful sense of abundance. So that once you have this whole system up and running, then a standard of, of the production or the service or whatever has been established. And in the sixth day, that's symbolized by man, which is a technical term in both Greek and Hebrew that has to do with the highest qualities that we see in humanity. So the standard becomes the highest qualities of that creative project. And then there's a sense of completeness the seventh day, the Lord rests, the assumption not being that God needs a vacation in Florida, but that the project is complete. And so these steps of a creative project have been repeated in so much research, especially not based on the Bible, that it was sort of a stunner. And in fact, if people will go look at the seven articles of the Constitution and apply that model, some very interesting things come out, which is another discussion. Right, and, and I thought that was interesting. I did, however, miss on my exam. What was the second one? <laughs> <laughs> the second one is when 
is the, the second one in the Bible, the second day of creation is the firmament, which is this, sh- in the symbolism of the ancient world, this strip of hammered metal that supposedly separated the waters above from the waters below. In the ancient world, there was a sense of waters being above the earth and waters below the earth, and they had to be separated. So it's the sorting out process that always goes on when someone asks after the first step, the vision mm-hmm. is there. Are you then founding something in the second step that is consistent with that vision? And so you have to define everything within that according to that. So, for instance, if I want to start a Chinese restaurant, I don't start collecting pizza dough in the second step. Right. Uh, and I don't start ordering Italian furniture. I stay consistent with my vision. Then comparing it as you do, because I mentioned there are other documents, sacred texts that you have derived, you know, a model for economics. And one of them, you said, was the Lord's Prayer. Mm-hmm. One of the things that happens with the Lord's Prayer, there are originally, again, seven statements in it, if you don't count the, the, the last couple. And without going through that in detail, what it really is, is stating in, in a very noticeable way is a sense of interconnectedness and abundance. And when you apply just those two concepts to any kind of economic situation, it's always going to have someone come out the other end better than saying, oh, well, there is no order to the universe and so on. So if, if I take a practical situation in which, going back to my example, if I'm looking for something either to maximize products or services or even get a job, I'm a reemployment consultant. What can happen is that if I network and I put my creative output out there, right. and I put my values out there, and also I trust that the people out there will bring something back to me, I'm actually trusting a kind of order of the universe, that consciousness we were talking about. Well, you know, and it's interesting relative to on spiritual levels, whether it's a Tibetan discipline or any other, mm-hmm. where they talk about very much the ability to empty in order to fill up. It's like if we're a vessel that holds water, the ability to empty out so that we can let new water in. Mm-hmm. And you sort of are describing... If, if we see ourselves as sort of a central sun and we radiate outwards all these talents and things, they shower on others, and of course there's growth in the garden. Mm-hmm. And I think that's important because in the, our books we have brought in a lot of the world's spiritual traditions. Tibetan Buddhism is one of my favorites, and Taoism and so on. And in all of those traditions, the idea is that if there is this higher order and a sense of interconnectedness, there's going to be a regular emptying and a refilling yeah, the, the rhythm of expansion and contraction, right. or breathing, right. or life and death. Yes, right. it's all the same. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. I also suspect that a great deal of that has been going on around the turn of the millennium, for whatever reason, whether it's just individuals' expectations or something else happening, that most people will find their lives have been pretty much thrown into a chaos sometime over the last couple of years, and things have been tested and so on, so that there is the emergence of, a, of an even higher consciousness and a freer consciousness but right now, a lot of us are still in the trenches and in the chaos and trying to figure out where it's going. That's when the trust for a higher order becomes very important. Well, and, and it's different. You know, I have often argued over the years that people say, well, you know, you're fighting for national sovereignty, and doesn't that belie you're speaking to a one-world humanity? I have always been, you know, quick to, to make a differentiation between you can grow a community so that there's harmony, but to impose somebody else's will and design over the top of the supposed free-willed human in order to create a one is not the same thing as unfolding from diversity into union. Right. And I think that's basically what you're saying, is that our economic model currently, through all of these major mega institutions, World Bank, international treaty law, and whatnot, is trying to conscript everything to create the one versus with love unfolding from the center all the diverse parts that are part of the whole. Yes, it may sound idealistic to people to insist on respecting individuality and diversity, but if if individuals notice, in the first place, the United States as a successful federal entity, when it, in, I'm taking that sense in the sense of the old Federalist Papers as a, as a government entity, The success of that is based on a respect for individual creativity and how that individual creativity creates creative communities. Sure. You don't create it from the top down, whereas the model that the World Bank and so on are using is very much the same model the communist countries tried to use, and it just failed. Now, if it just failed, why are we calling the opposite of that idealistic? It's a very kind of funny analysis, and I'm always sort of puzzled when people say, oh, well, no, that's idealistic to insist on individuality and national sovereignty. And I thought... 
Well, the opposite of that just collapsed to everybody's applause within the last 10 years. Exactly. But, you know, it's interesting. You can dress fascism up right. to make it look very pleasant. Yes. And, uh, you know, distribution for all until you remember that they're controlling the labor, the distribution, and the product. Right. <laughs> so right. no freedom in that, as I used to joke a, lo a long time ago. A friend of mine taught me this. If you're happy and you know it, <laughs> clank your chains. Right. <laughs>